shares it with works. And meanwhile, you can start uh, screen sharing, please. This visible? Yes, very good. Very good. So I'm uh, very glad to present your quid. Uh, and he will tell us uh, about uh, the little while group of a real spherical space, which is a joint work with Aiton Sayer. Please. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, let me begin with a, with a bit of motivation. Um, for this, I'm going to choose um, a real algebraic reductive group G. This is in, through the entire talk. Um, same one. And um, so usually Lie algebras I will denote by the corresponding um, Gothic fracture letter. Um, and um, I, I want first to look at symmetric spaces. So I'm going to choose an involution. Um, and look at the stabilizer subgroup, fixed point subgroup of this involution. So then the corresponding homogeneous space, G mod H, um, is a reductive symmetric space. Now, there are two, in this context, there are two root systems and two well groups around. Um, so let me try to describe those. Um, I begin by choosing a Cartan involution. Evolution, commuting with, with sigma. Um, so that actually my Lie algebra then decomposes. I will use this involution also for the for the uh, the corresponding so the latter also for the corresponding involution on the Lie algebra. So the Lie algebra then decomposes um, into a plus and one eigenspace for both of these involutions. So we first have maybe a k plus s, um, where this is the plus one and this is the minus one eigenspace for theta, um, but at the same time it's also an h plus r. Um, where this is the plus one and the minus one, plus one and minus one eigenspace for sigma. Um, so I'm going to choose a split, maximal split abelian subalgebra in the following way. So I begin by choosing something that's maximal abelian in the intersection of the two minus one eigenspaces. This thing I call A of A minus sigma. So I choose it in S intersected R. Um, Better. Um, maximal abelian. And then I can extend to a maximal abelian one, um, which I call A in S. Um, if you do it in this way, then the A is automatically stable under sigma um, and stable under theta. And the minus one eigenspace for, um, for sigma in this A is as big as it gets. So then we have the following two root systems. So first of all, we have the root system that's at, attached to the, um, to the group, if you want, um, as I already know by, by sigma. Um, you get this thing as the A weights of the adjoint representation. And then you remove the zero. Um, there's also a well group attached to this thing. Um, it's just a well group of this root system. Um, and you can get it as uh, a quotient of the normalizer of A by the centralizer of A. This is the first root system and the first well group you have. Um, this has really nothing to do with the symmetric space. So the second one will have to do with then, which I call uh, the root system I will call um, sigma of small sigma because it comes from this involution. Um, these are the the roots, so to say, of um, A minus sigma in G. Um, again, it's the same kind of, of description. So you can look at the A minus sigma weights of the adjoint representation. So A is also the 
cartan of the actual entire group, although you like chose it to be in S, but it's become the cartan of the, it is, the group. It is the split part, right? So if you want to have the full cartan, you need to to extend it also with the max with the with the compact. Uh, ah, I see. Uh, so the, the W, so it's a root system which is corresponds to the real form. Exactly. Exactly. This is all real. Yeah? So yeah. Uh, please remind, what is A minus sigma? A minus sigma uh, is here. So I begin with A minus sigma. So this is a maximal abelian subalgebra in the intersection of the two minus one eigenspaces. Right, so it's the minus one eigenspace part of A. The, the choice of theta is somehow unique up to something nice, or it's... Uh, it's it's unique good. up to conjugation by H. Yeah. Okay. And just A is bigger than A minus sigma? Right, so so you begin with A minus sigma as a maximal abelian subalgebra in the intersection of the... Uh, and then we extend it to A. And then you extend it to a full. So this, in this way, you get it sigma stable, and you make sure that the minus one eigenspace is as big as it gets. Um, there is also a well group attached to this thing, which, um, as, as in the first case, you can describe by a quotient. Um, so here, you can take the normalizer of this A minus sigma and divide it by the centralizer. Um, or if you want, what you could do is, is describe it as a sub quotient of the, of the bigger well group. Um, so you look at the normalizer in the well group of A minus sigma and mod out the centralizer. So this is the usual root system and the usual well group number one for the, uh, for the group. Um, and in the second one, this is something that is related to the, uh, to the symmetric space. Um, so, um, in the, the world of symmetric spaces, these things do not really have a name, um, but maybe you could call this the little root system and the little vowel group. So it seems that in the context um, of spherical spaces, this, this vowel group is called the little vowel group. Um, okay, so now the question is, is there a meaningful generalization to something more um, more general. So, um, so if I if I have an algebraic subgroup of G, um, not necessarily reductive, not necessarily symmetric, um, just anything, um, and I I look at the corresponding homogeneous space, then the question is: Is there a meaningful little well group? Um, or a meaningful little root system. Attached to this to this homogeneous space. And the answer is yes, there is. Um, this was first done by Riong um, for spherical spaces. Um, over C. Um, and then there was a fast generalization by Friedrich Knoop, um, again over algebraically uh, closed fields, but, but the, the, the assumption of spherical is being dropped, and there are several uh, constructions. Um, algebraically closed characteristic zero. Um, and the algebraic closed um, um, assumption is was recently also dropped by, uh, by Knoop and Krutz. Friedrich. Um, so the assumption here is characteristic zero. So in, in this generality, you can actually put um, a, attach a, a vowel group and a root system um, to an, um, an, an um, a homogeneous space like this. Um, it, this root system and the vowel group do not come about in this nice way as, as for, the, for the symmetric space, right? So here you look at the weights of, uh, of the adjoint representation. Um, remove the zero, you get a root system. Um, the vowel group is, is somehow um, um, also described by a, by a nice quotient. Um, 
So this, this idea of looking at weights, um, this you can forget about. So this is not how these things come about. Um, so there's another way of, of looking at also at the symmetric spaces um, so, that, so that you can actually mean, uh, generalize it in a meaningful way. Um, this has a lot to do with the, um, the compactifications um, of sets. So this is very closely related to the compactifications, compactification theory. Um, or maybe um, actually what, what is really happening there is that the fundamental domain of the of the wow group, of the little wow group, um, um, is, is playing a fundamental role in these, um, in these compactifications. So somehow this describes uh, the geometry at infinity of the of the homogeneous space. Um, so this is also reflected in, in the harmonic analysis on, um, on, on um, symmetric spaces and also on real spherical spaces. Um, so on symmetric spaces, um, if you look at the, the image of the Fourier transform on the symmetric space, then, then it has certain invariances. And these invariances are described by a, a representation of the little well group for a symmetric space. Um, so when it's, it's expected that, that the same will be true for real spherical spaces. So Patrick Delorme is at the moment working on this. And also uh, um, I'm working together with Aitan um, on, the, on the most continuous part um, where, where you see these, these symmetries of the little well group occurring. Um, so our understanding of, um, of the little wow group is different of the, from the understanding of, of, of Brion and Knoop and also the Knoop and Crutz version. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, I, I want to understand uh, you, there is some difference between the case of C and the case of arbitrary algebraic cross field of characteristic zero, you? Yeah, you, so, so, so the, the spherical, Assumption is dropped here. This is not even spherical. Ah, I see. So it, it's it's ridiculously general. Mm -hmm. And and when the algebraic clause is dropped, also the spherics is dropped, like just yeah. general yeah. transitive at least. Uh, well, it needs to be a um, it needs to be a, a, a G space. Huh? So it's it's a G variety. Um, so this is in the reductive group actions um, paper um, of, of uh, Ben Well, but it, have to, it even does, doesn't have to be transitive in variety. No, uh, so no, I mean it's not necessarily just a homogeneous space. So this can be the compactification. Um, yeah. So so our point of view from harmonic analysis is rather that that um, that what you're interested in is very often a limit of something. So you have an, an object like a, like a matrix coefficient. Um, or, a, or an invariant functional, um, and you want to see what happens if you take a limit of this matrix coefficient or a, uh, or a limit of this, of this functional. And the invariances you have um, will in the limit result also in some invariance, but under a, a corresponding limit subgroup. Um, so um, this is basically our point of view and um, and, 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 Aitan and I started to work on this um, for the, for, under the assumption of real spherical spaces. Um, let me let me first in, say what I mean by um, uh, by limits. So in the remainder of this of this talk, I'm going to fix a number of things. So I I'm going to fix the Cartan involution, which I, I don't really need. Um, what I actually need is the uh, is this this a. Um, so I'm going to choose this uh, maximal abelian in in S um, the minus one eigenspace um, for theta. Um, um, and then uh, this comes then automatically with the, the root system which, um, of, of A and G, which, which I denote by, by sigma. Okay, so what do I mean by a, by a limit? Um, so very general, if I have a subspace um, E, then, so maybe of, of dimension K, um, and I have an element um, x, then I can, I can let this x act on e in the following sense. And I take the adjoint representation, x dx, let that act on e, uh, but t is some, some real number. Then I, I can look at what happens when I make this t very big. So I take the limit for t to infinity. So this limit makes sense in the Grassmannian um, of subspaces in G of dimension K. 
Um, so slimmers always exist. Um, and they have also somewhat nice properties. Um, so in general, it's, it's for example true that if, if G is a subalgebra, then also the limit will be a subalgebra. So nice properties of, of subspaces are being preserved. Um, let me give an, a very concrete example. So we're going to, um, to look at the group case as a symmetric space. Um, so here, I'm going to take for G actually two copies of a, of a group G naught, which I choose um, reductive. Um, so real algebraic reductive group. And for H, I take the diagonal subgroup. So now G mod H is diffeomorphic to G naught. So one copy of G naught X on the left, the other X on the right. Um, I'm going to choose an A in a nicest way that I can think of. Namely, I take um, an A naught in, in, in the Lie algebra of G naught, um, as, as, as I described before. And I, I, I take actually uh, then, then, uh, for both of the copies, I take the same one. So this is as symmetric as it gets. It fits very well to this uh, diagonal thing. So this is not at all the generic choice. It's a very specific one. Um, and I'm going to look as a subspace, I'm going to look at the, the Lie algebra of this. Of this group H, or the diagonal of G naught. So now the question is, if I have an element X in A, uh, this is really then an X1, a pair X1, X2 in A. The question is, what is the limit of this Lie algebra? So again, this is what I'm going to do is, is take the limit for T to infinity of the adjoint representation of X PX acting on this Lie algebra. Um, the easiest way to, to compute this is by looking what happens to specific lines in this Lie algebra. So what I'm going to do is first choose a weight. Um, so I write maybe sigma not for the root system. I also want to include the zero weight um, for, for this A not. Um, so take one of these weights and then I take an element y in the corresponding weight space. Um, so G naught alpha. So then the element y comma y, so maybe I take this non-zero. The element y comma y is now an element in H. So the line through it is also a line in H. And I can, uh, so in a diagonal, I can look at the limit of this. So what do I get? Um, so if I compute what this line actually is, if I if I apply to y comma y the, um, the adjoint representation, then x1 x with uh, the eigenvalue alpha of, of x1 on the first component, and x x with the eigenvalue alpha of x2 on the second component. This is an alpha x2 and y. Um, yeah, so now there are three possibilities. Um, if alpha of x1 is larger than alpha of x2, then the first component is going to win. So I get the line through y0. Um, could also be the other way around. If alpha of x1 is smaller than alpha of x2, then I get the line through 0y. Um, and if they're the same, then it's just a simultaneous scaling, which is then absorbed in, the, in, the, in this line, and in this line after all. So then I just get the diagonal. Okay, so now I know what happens to these lines. And this tells me um, that I already know actually a large subspace of this limit. I have a question. Sure. Yep. Did you introduce this notation E sub X? I'm not sure, so on page four. Ah, so, yeah, so I want to, to denote by limits by this. Yeah, so I think I wrote it, um, I wrote it here. Yeah, so I want to look at HX ah, okay. as a limit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Somehow the problem with this, with this Zoom thing is that you can write very little on one page and it, it just flashes away. So um, anybody has a question like this, then please say so. 
Can, can you explain again? So why the limit exists always? Uh, well, I, I didn't tell you yet. Um, yeah, so it's it's basically um, a projection onto eigenspaces. It just depends on what kind of eigenvalues occur. Uh, so you can you can actually write this down in, in, in an algebraic fashion. Um, so it's it's not really an analytic uh, kind of problem that you have here. It just depends on the on the eigenvalues occur. So the advantage of taking x in this a is that actually this this is then semi simple. It's hyperbolic. Yeah? So it has it has real eigenvalues and and then this will automatically. Um, you can also think of it somehow in, in the Plucker coordinate. So, so there is um, uh, there's somehow a line attached to it, and, and you um, to, to the subspace. Um, you look basically at the eigens at the eigen decomposition for this for this element x. Yeah? So you take the largest eigenvalue. It's just a projection onto the largest eigenvalue. Okay. Um, yeah, as I said, so. If if you understand what happens to these lines, then you 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 already know then a large subspace. Um, so, what is in this limit? Well, um, first of all, I have maybe the I start with the third option. Um, if alpha of x one is equal to alpha of x two, so I look at all the at all the weights alpha that vanishes on x1 minus x2, then I get the diagonal of the weight space in there. Um, then maybe we go to the first option. If alpha of x1 is larger than alpha of x2, then I get the following. Um, so this doesn't happen for the zero weight, so I only, only have the roots. Um, then alpha of x1 minus x2 is positive. Um, then I get the sum over the, um, the weight spaces in the first component and the zero in the second component. Um, and I have something similar and for the um, for the rest, let me shift this a little bit. Uh, for the other for the other option, so these are the roots on which um, alpha of x1 minus x2 is negative, um, then I get zero times the weight space in the second component. Um, yeah, so a priori, this is just an inclusion, but then you can do a dimension count and you see actually that the dimension on the left hand side, which is the dimension of the B algebra of G naught, is actually the same as the dimension on the right hand side. So actually, these things have to be the same. So you get a very explicit expression. Um, the nicest limits you get when x1 minus x2 is regular. So x1 minus x2 regular. So what happens then? Well, then in this first sum here, you, you only get the zero weight. So that's the diagonal of the centralizer of A. In the, the other parts are going then to be a full um, maximal um, unipotent sub, so maximal unipotent subalgebra, um, which is determined by the, the x1 minus x2. So this this determines an ordering on this on this root system. Um, and um, so what you get here is in the first component, um, in the first component this maximal uh, unipotent subalgebra, and the second component you get the zero. So maybe I'll write this as n times zero. So this is a maximal uh, no potent subalgebra. It's a sum of root spaces. Um, and in the, the last part, you get the opposite of that thing. So if you have here the positive roots for the second one, then for the third one, you have the negative roots. Um, so this I denote by, by n bar. These are the negative roots. Some of the negative root spaces in here, we have the positive roots with respect in both cases to x1 minus x2. Um, the interesting thing is, is that all of these limits are conjugate to each other. Right? The, the, the first part is the diagonal of the centralizer is always the same. Um, but the, 
unipotent, nilpotent subalgebras you get here are conjugate to each other. Um, so let me try to say that a bit more formally. This is an observation. If I, if I fix an element in A, if x1 minus x2 regular, and then I look at, at all possible limits I can get compared to, to the one I get for, for this direction x. So I look at all possible limits. Um, I'm only actually interested in the ones where that this difference is, is regular. So x prime is an A um, if x1 prime minus x2 prime regular. So if I look at the entire set, then I get conjugates of hx of this fixed limit. And the conjugates are given by elements from the normalizer. So the diagonal of the normalizer in G naught um, of A naught. Uh, so all of these maximal uh, nilpotent subalgebras that I obtain um, are all conjugate under, under uh, the normalizer of, of A naught. Um, and because you have this positive one and the negative one, you need to do at the same time. Uh, so to both of them the same thing. So this is why uh, you have to act by, um, by this diagonal. Um, this is interesting for the following reason. Um, namely, if I look at this diagonal and I mod out the stabilizer um, of of hx, uh, so of, of a given of a given limit, um, the stabilizer of hx is going to be the diagonal of the centralizer of a naught. So this is here, a small computation is the stabilizer of hx. Then I get something like the diagonal of the val group um, of this uh, group g times g. Um, and this thing here. This is actually the little well group in this setting. So I look at limits and I obtain at the end of the day the little well group as uh, as the as symmetries of the limits um, for generic generic directions. Um, so this is the uh, the idea that uh, that Aiden and I used uh, to. To, uh, to construct a little bow group uh, for real spherical spaces. Um, so I have to emphasize here that, um, that, that in the beginning, um, when, I, uh, when we started with this, with this, uh, uh, this group case, um, we chose the A very specifically, right? So the, um, you, you, you start with the nicest uh, um, stabilizer subalgebra, the diagonal, diagonal of G naught, um, and you choose an A to it that fits very well to this setting. Um, so if you wouldn't do that, you take somehow a generic choice of A, uh, then this is going to be a total mess, this computation. Uh, you cannot really do it very well. Um, and the answer is also going to be different, uh, different than this. So in general, you won't find a little vowel group, you will find something bigger. Um, okay. Good. So, so let me uh, then now introduce the spaces that, that we are actually um, interested in. Uh, so as I said, these are the real spherical spaces. Um, so first of all, I'm going to take uh, now in the remainder for H, uh, an algebraic subgroup of G. Doesn't have to be reductive or anything, just algebraic. Um, and I'm going to consider the homogeneous space and I will call this thing Z. I'm going to fix um, a minimal parabolic. Um, which I call P. And I also fixed the Langlands decomposition of this parabolic. MAN. So A is now as before. M is the centralizer in K of A. Um, N is the, uh, is the unipotent radical. 
um, with this join system, I also have then a root system again living on A, um, for which I will still write sigma if I need it. Um, but more importantly, the parabolic also fixes a positive system. Um, and therefore also uh, a positive and a negative well, which will be important in a minute. Um, so compared to what I did before is, is that I, before for symmetric spaces, I started with the uh, stabilizer subgroup um, and I built out of that a, an, an, an A which very nicely fits to it. And, and it, but in this generality, somehow I don't know um, what to do here. So um, I, I just do it the other way around. I fix an A and I'm later on going to look at different um, different choices for, for points for stabilizers in Z. Okay, so we're going to assume that Z is real spherical. And this means that the parabolic subgroup has an open orbit in Z. Okay, as I said, I want to, um, to vary my points um, and uh, to accommodate, I will just introduce the following notation. Um, so I will let go of, of, the, of, of the, the fixed origin uh, with the stabilizer subgroup H, but instead, um, if I have a point Z, then I will write um, H Z for the stabilizer subalgebra. Subalgebra of Z um, and the corresponding subgroup um, H Z. So this is the stabilizer subgroup. Um, if I have furthermore an element X and A, um, then I want to consider uh, the limit of, of the stabilizer subalgebra. So these I will denote by H Z X. Um, so what this is, it's the stabilizer subalgebra, and I take the, of that thing the limit in the x direction, um, and let me just write this down once more. This is the limit for t to infinity, the adjoint representation of x dx acting on h set, yeah, where the limit is taken in the gross plane. Um, so in this situation, where the um, the uh, the subgroup H is spherical, real spherical, actually all of the limits. Uh, that you can take are again also real spherical subalgebras, uh, which is a bit of a miracle, uh, but it's actually a very nice property. So what you what you obtain here as as limits is um, um, is fairly well understood actually. It's not a it's not a very big zoo. Um, you can describe it rather explicitly. Um, we are going to first pick a limit as a standard limit so that we uh, later on when we take some other limit, we can compare it to the standard one. So we're going to fix uh, a limit which will be our favorite limit from now on. Um, and this is called the horror spherical degeneration. So degeneration because you degenerate um, the, uh, uh, the subalgebra uh, by taking this limit. Um, and this or a spherical degeneration you would obtain in the following way. So I take a point set such that PZ is open. So a point in an open P orbit. Now I take a direction X in the negative valve chamber. So this is uh, the open negative valve chamber uh, with respect to this uh, parabolic. Um, the limit subalgebra that is going to be our standard limit subalgebra, uh, this is in the literature called H empty. Um, and this is the limit of this um, stabilizer subalgebra of the point set um, in the direction X. So the notation somehow indicates that this um, it doesn't depend on, on X and set, which is almost true. Um, so uh, this limit is independent of X, the choice of X. And it's almost independent of the choice of Z. Um, there is a, an annoying um, thing that is left. So up to M conjugation, it is independent of the choice of the base point.
So actually, what would be better is actually if you if you would look at M conjugacy classes, um, the M, M conjugacy class of of this um, of this repository. That is really um, the, the uh, invariant thing. Good. So as I said, this is um, our uh, basic limit. So you you could say a lot more about this about this uh, uh, this this subalgebra. You can write down a formula. Um, I won't uh, won't bother you with that. Um, so it's explicitly known, um, but for our purpose, it's just enough to know that that, that we fix it um, in this way. Um, now I'm going to compare limits of subalgebras to this standard limit. So if I have a point set, then I'm going to define a set phi z. This set is going to be all elements in the normalizer of A that I can see in such a limit. Um, so to be more precise, the all elements W so that there exists an X in A um, with the property that the limit of the stabilizer subalgebra in the direction X is going to be the W conjugate of H empty. Um, so as I said before, somehow there is a there is here a problem. Um, so where is this? There is a problem with M conjugacy. Um, so um, to make this a bit better, to avoid this problem with M conjugacy, I'm going to take here um, M conjugacy classes, and for that I write brackets. So whenever I write these square brackets, it's going to be M conjugacy. This is not really important. You can also forget about it, ignore all the brackets. Um, but to be formally correct, you need to make sure that that uh, the M doesn't destroy everything. So I'm, I'm going to look at all the elements in the normalizer of A that somehow can be seen as, um, as a limit um, in, in this sense, right? So I compare to my, to my standard limit um, uh, and, and, then, and then list all of them. So, um, so here you also need uh, a, the, the A minus or? Uh, or no, just any A, any direction. But then, it, but then it doesn't depend also on the choice. Ah, so the existing, sorry. Okay, never mind, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so it's any, any direction, right? Yeah. So it's, it's um, yeah. Like in the group case, right? So there, I, I looked at all possible limits, and then then you 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 at the end, if you take all of these limits together, then you you get to see the little bow group. So this is the same here. So I don't only want to look in a negative direction. Now I look in every direction, and I'm going to compare to this equation. Um, this equation here, um, h so the limit of in of set of h set in the x direction is equal to uh, to this conjugate of H empty, this is not uniquely determined the Val group element. So, so there is a stabilizer of H empty. Um, so uh, I want to bot that out eventually. So I'm going to, um, to, to define uh, the stabilizer of the thing. It's called phi empty. These are all elements in the normalizer of A, for which um, the W conjugate of H empty is equal to H empty. And again, I do this everything here up to M conjugacy. So I write brackets around it. Okay. So the theorem that I done and I proved is now the following. There exists a point set. So that the following hold. First of all, like in the group case, if you take a, 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 an element in a generic, um, so you take a limit in a generic direction, you you find uh, a conjugate of a fixed uh, limit. So same here, for generic X and A, the limit H at X is a conjugate of H empty. And again, here, everything up to M conjugacy, just to be sure. Um, so this is for some W in the normalizer. Uh, this means that this um, effectively is mean is that, that this set phi z here, sort of all the uh, elements uh, uh, W in the normalizer that can occur that you can see in this uh, as, as such a limit is going to be rather big. Um, the claim is, is that this phi set is actually a group. Moreover, the 
what I defined here as the stabilizer, V infinity, um, a stabilizer of, 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 of sorry, v, v empty, the stabilizer of H empty. This is going to be a normal subgroup. Of Vz, so I can take the quotient. And the quotient, which I maybe denote by W and then big Z, um, maybe not, maybe I do it with curly W, I don't know. Um, I don't know. A group means a subgroup of the normalizer? Right, so this is, yeah, right, exactly. So it's really, it's a subgroup of the normalizer of A. Yeah, the quotient is a little wow group as defined by uh, Knopf and Krutz. Um, so we see here the, the little wow group occurring again as symmetries of, um, of, of the limits, of limits of algebras. Um, so the time that remains, I would like to explain a little bit of, of how this comes about. So the, the first thing um, to note here is that, that if you define this, this set uh, Vz, and there is no reason at all why this would be a subgroup a priori. It's just a, a set of Ws that you can see in, in limits. Um, so if you think a bit more about the limits, um, then you see why this group structure could exist. Um, so let me try to explain this. So this is, I will call the equivariance of limits. Um, this is as follows. If we have an element in the normalizer of A, and we have a point set in set, and we have an, a direction X in A, then I can take the limit of the stabilizer subalgebra of the point set and let W act on it. So I, I look at, at this beast. Well, what is this? So this is the, the W conjugate of a limit. Um, I can put the limit through the, through, the, through the conjugate. So I get the limit for T to infinity of the W conjugate of uh, add of X dx acting on H set, the stabilizer of algebra. Um, there is no reason why I wouldn't pull this through, so I will. Um, this is going to conjugate my, my x. Um, and then the, the w is, is acting on h set. And that's then just this, the stabilizer subalgebra of the shifted point. So what I get here is a, a limit of the stabilizer subalgebra w set in the direction of wx. So this is an equivariance property of, of limits under the, uh, the normalizer of a. Um, which is uh, um, <coughs> a very useful thing. Uh, so the, can, the group. Can I ask about uh, the theorem? Yes. Um, so, so, so can you give a characterization of, of a Z which is good without knowing the Knopf uh, definition? Uh, yes. I, I, yes, you can. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to compare to what, what, what of course, is the definition of Knopf and Krutz. Yes? I mean, so at the end of the day, I claim that I end up with a group which is the same. Um, but there, um, there is a, a, um, a canonical set, uh, which is called the compression cone, I will come to this, uh, which should be the fundamental domain of the little well group. Um, so from, from, um, from the point of view of harmonic analysis and um, and this is how you, at the end of the day, see that actually you get you get what uh, Knopf and Kurtz uh, defined at, at the same time. So, so this should lie in this compression cone. Yes. So, so you need to point, you need to choose a point set so that that you get the compression cone somehow as a fundamental domain. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the compression cone is an invariant of the of the space. I will I will come to this. Mm -hmm. Um, and you need to, to somehow um, choose your point set so that, that, uh, that this will be a fundamental domain. Maybe might, one might ask is if P 
set is open. Is this then a good set? No, 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 no. It's much more, much more uh, specific than that. Uh, so already in the group case, as I said, so you, you, you choose a very specific A uh, to get to get some out to your computation. So that, that also needs to be here. Uh, but I will, I will come to this. Yeah. Um, so for now, I mean. This equivariance, this is for anything. Yeah? So we don't need a special point set. This is this is always, um, always. Okay, so let me explain how you get now um, a kind of a product structure on um, out of out of this equivariance. So I start with a W that occurs as a limit for a point set, right? So that's what this VZ uh, uh, did. So this was the list, uh, sort of the set of, of elements in the, in the normalizer, which can be seen in a limit. So I, I take one of these. Um, then I take another point, but from a different set. I'm going to, to change my base point uh, to W inverse set, look at the corresponding set of elements that can occur um, as a limit, and take a W prime um, there. So the second, this second um, element yeah, so what, what did it mean? I mean, um, this, by definition, this, this means that there exists an element, a direction X and A, so that the limit of the stabilizer subalgebra in the direction of X is equal to the W conjugate of H empty and everything here I do up to M conjugacy. So if I take this identity that I have here and apply the equivariance, then I get to see the following. So let me look at the limit of the stabilizer of set in the direction of Wx. Then the equivariance says that I can take the W outside, and this goes at the cost of a shift of the base point. So it's shifted to W inverse set. And now I take the limit in the x direction. This is just the equivariance uh, property of the previous page. But this limit here on the right hand side, this I know, this is going to be, um, sorry, this should be a w prime. This is the w prime. Uh, so here I get add of w times w prime of h empty. And this is all up to m conjugacy. So uh, let me put brackets in there. So what I have found is that for the point set, there is a direction, I don't care what it is, so that W, W prime actually occurs. So the conclusion is that W, W prime sits, is an element of VZ. Okay, so this is not really a product structure on anything because I take elements from different, different sets um, and then I can multiply them. So what, what does it mean? I mean, it's a priori is not so clear. So you need to, to find somehow a good point uh, so that this actually becomes a group structure. So this is the maybe a proposition. Um, if your point set is so that, um, that all of these sets are the same. So w, VW inverse set is equal to VZ for all Ws that occur can occur in this computation. So for all W and VZ then this VZ is a group. Um, so how do you see this? Well, actually this VZ is, is not so far away from being finite. Um, so um, it's really MA cosets, if you want, or, or, or centralizer of A cosets that you look at here. If you mod that out, then you get a finite set. Um, so this condition here, that you put on, on VZ, uh, then means that, that actually the VZ is going to be closed undertaking products. And, and uh, on a finite set, then, then this means that this is going to be a group. So this is coming straight out of the equivariance. Um, the good news is that if you take Z generic, then, uh, then you already get a group here. So this is not going to be the little var group, it's, it's too big. Um, but to find here a group structure is fairly easy. This is not, um, not so much of the problem. Um, so as I said, so we um, we want at the end of the day uh, that the quotient that we form is going to be the little bow group. So you need to way uh, to uh, to identify the little bow group. Um, 
um, as I said also before, this is um, this is done by looking at the compression cost. So now we are going. I'm going to have a look at um, at the candidate for the fundamental domain um, of the of the middle one. So, so again, if I want to, so the the second part the, to prove that only VZ is a group. So this is a gen generic condition. That's what you say. That generic. Yeah. Z will... Yeah. So actually, if you would take set generic, then this is already the case. Yeah. So four is the problem. It, this creates right. the... So you, you can't choose set generic. I mean, you have to choose it very specific. Otherwise, you won't find the little vowel group. You find something else. Yeah. Right? But to find a group is not here the problem. This is easy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So as I said, compression cone. This is the cone to be the candidate of the fundamental domain. Um, so here I again fix a point set. Uh, in fact, and then I'm going to look at all directions in A that give me my standard limit. So it's the set of X in A, so that the limit of the stabilizer subalgebra in the X direction is equal to H empty. And again, everything up to M conjugacy. Um, this you could maybe call the compression cone for the point set. So it compresses the stabilizer subalgebra towards the standard, uh, standard limit. This thing has um, some properties, some nice properties. Um, so first of all, it actually shows you whether you're in an open P orbit or not. Um, to be precise, so this uh, compression cone for this point is going to be non-empty if and only if P times set is an open orbit. Um, if it is open, then we also, this is um, what, we, uh, what I discussed before, then we find um, the negative valve chamber in here. Right? This is how I actually defined the standard, uh, standard limit, H empty. Uh, it's independent of, of the choice of uh, element in A minus U2. So actually all of A minus is going to end up in this compression curve. Um, there is, however, a big problem. Um, and that, in general, um, you, you see it already happening here a bit. So whether uh, whether you're in an open orbit or not actually makes a huge difference. Um, but in general, even even if you take your z, your point in an open orbit, uh, it's going to depend heavily on on the on the choice of the point. So in, the, in general, it actually strongly depends um, on z. Uh, so maybe I'll give an example. Uh, so a nice spherical, real spherical space is G mod N bar. So N is the opposite of, uh, of the N of the parabolic subgroup. Uh, the open orbit is P times N bar. Um, the compression cone for the standard origin, so E times N bar, this is going to be everything. Uh, the Lie algebra is already A stable. So if I conjugate it, I always get the same thing. It's also in the limit. Um, however, if I... Um, modify my base point by an element from N, then I'm going to destroy a lot. Um, so this is never um, equal to A if, um, if N is not um, uh, the, trivial, the trivial element in N. Um, you can actually um, uh, translate your, your base point by M and A. That doesn't do anything. Uh, but you cannot translate it in, in the n direction. This, uh, this is destroying it immediately. Um, and you get actually all, all possible uh, unions of valve chambers if you, uh, if you vary over, over the n. So you can make it also very small. So you can actually make it so that's only the negative uh, valve chamber. So this is an issue. So, so um, um, when I said in the theorem, there exists a point. So again, this has to be very specific. Yeah? So, um, so we need to choose uh, the point set so that, that this problem at least goes away. This you do in the following way. So we call this adapted points. Um, so let me just give the definition. A point set and set is adapted. And here adapted needs to be understood as uh, adapted to the parabolic subgroup and to its Langlands decomposition in particular to the to the choice of a if um, if the following two things hold 
So first of all, I want to have a point in the um, in the open orbit. Um, so PZ is open. Uh, so this is the only reasonable thing to do because I want to somehow find a nice compression cone. And if I'm not in an open orbit, then this the, the, the CZ is empty. So, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to really look at this. So that's the first condition. And the second condition is a regularity condition. This is um, um, uh, a bit more technical. Um, so what I want is that there are elements in the killing auto complement. So here the perp is, is uh, the killing with respect to the killing form. So I take the killing auto complement of the stabilizer intersected with H uh, with A. So I, I want to have uh, elements in A which are killing orthogonal to the stabilizer. And if possible, I want to have them regular such that so alpha of X is non zero for all. Um, alpha and sigma. Um, however, if I would do it like this, then this is unreasonable. Um, there are certain um, roots a priori uh, on, on which it cannot possibly uh, be zero, uh, non-zero if, 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 if it also, if the x also has to be uh, perpendicular. Um, uh, and these are the, the following roots. Um, so if you would have a root, so that's the, the corresponding co-root lies in A intersected with H empty, um, then you have a problem. So I only require this for the roots for which this is not the case. So, so this last you could see as follows. Somehow, um, if, if this part of A occurs in the limit, so in, in the H empty, uh, then it has to come from, from, uh, from something in H itself, so H set. Um, so uh, the projection onto, onto A, according to the, uh, the root space decomposition of H set, will actually contain this, uh, this subspace here. So if, if your X needs to be perpendicular to H set, then it in, print, in, uh, uh, in particular needs to be perpendicular to, to that subspace. Uh, and this, this is uh, uh, giving this, this condition. So this is, this is unreasonable not to, to put that on there. Otherwise, you want it to, to be uh, regular. So. Yes. Okay, so why would these points be better than other points? Let me try to explain that. Um, first of all, these points tend to exist under an assumption. Um, each open P orbit in Z um, contains adapted points. And this is uh, following from the local structure theorem. Um, but here I have to make an assumption. Uh, so under the assumption that um, that set is quasi affine. This is not a big problem. Um, you can safely uh, assume that set is quasi affine because there is a trick uh, from which you can go to the non quasi affine case to the quasi affine case. So um, it really is not a restriction to assume this. Um, yeah, so actually the local structure theorem of, of, uh, uh, of Bernard and, and Friedrich Knoop and Henrik Stichko um, shows you that adapted points exist, um, but you have to read carefully in that paper. Um, so actually it follows from the proof and not so much from the statement uh, that is uh, written there. Um, these points are the best points somehow that you, um, that you can find. Um, given a, a parabolic a subgroup and its Langlands decomposition um, for the following reason. Um, if that is adapted, then the intersection of P with the stabilizer subgroup um, decomposes very nicely with respect to the Langlands decomposition. So this is going to be the intersection of M with the stabilizer times the intersection of A with the stabilizer times the intersection of N with the stabilizer. Um, you can even say what this A intersected uh, stabilizer is. And you can also explicitly describe what N intersected with the stabilizer is. Um, okay. 
Um, so, so this is somehow similar to what we did for the symmetric spaces, right? So there we started with a sigma, you choose your A very carefully. Um, uh, this is so that actually you can you can have this kind of, of, uh, of decomposition of P intersected with the stabilizer. Uh, it's the same here. Okay, um, so this property is not necessarily so interesting uh, for us yet because we were thinking about compression cones. So what does it do for the compression cone? Um, so let me let me fix uh, under the point. So let set and set be adapted. Then for all other points, set prime, we get actually a relation on these on these compression cones. The compression cone for Z prime is going to be contained in the compression cone for Z. So the compression cone for adapted points are the biggest ones. Um, and this also makes them actually then, then unique. So they're all the same for all uh, uh, for all adapted points. So, so in particular, this compression cone for Z is the same for all adapted points. Um, and this allows you to define then the compression cone of the of the uh, homogeneous space, the spherical space. Um, so I said just see I just dropped the index. Uh, where I take for Z an adapter point. So this um, this set here, this compression cone for. Um, um, for the real spherical space for set, this is going to be the candidate for the fundamental domain, or rather, um, the closure. So it has a few properties. Um, so first of all, this is um, this cone itself is open and and convex. Uh, and its closure is finitely generated. Um, this is or rather easy to see. Um, the second is, is that there are certain um, invariances. So this actually, this thing is, is uh, uh, contains, um, well, the closure contains a subspace a priori, which I call AH. Um, we have actually already seen it before. Um, uh, AH is the intersection of H of A with H empty. Um, so this thing always occurs in here. Um, and then you get the stabilizer somehow. You get you get uh, well, you get you get an invariant in the translations in that direction. Okay, let me give a few examples. Uh, one we have already seen. Um, Gmod and bar. Um, the compression cone is all of it, all of it. Um, if Z is symmetric, um, then you also have an explicit formula. It's as small as it could possibly be. It contains a negative valve chamber and it needs to contain this AH. Um, and for symmetric spaces, it's equal to the, to the sum of this. Uh, in general, it's not uh, equal to this. Um, you already see that up here, but even if, if maybe the subgroup is uh, reductive, then it doesn't have to be equal uh, uh, anyway. So for SO, 2,3 much the subspace AH is trivial, uh, but the compression cone is bigger than just a negative valve chain. So if I just make a quick drawing of the root system of SO2,3, uh, then maybe I have here my negative valve chamber and the compression cone is going to be two valve chambers. It's going to be um, this quadrant here. So this is this is the compression code. Okay. Um, maybe um, a reason why this um, compression cone can can be a fundamental domain for anything. So let's um, take an adapter point. 
Then the following holds. So if I have an value, so a, a, a W in the so in the normalizer of A, which I can see as a limit, right? So so here again, V Z. This is uh, all elements in the normalizer, which show up um, as a um, well can be seen as a as, as a limit. Uh, so a conjugate of A is empty. Um, then I know exactly in what directions I will get this conjugate. So then I get the following. So the limit of the stabilizer subalgebra is going to be equal to the W conjugate of H empty, modulo M, if and only if the element X comes from the well group sort of the sorry the, the w conjugate of the of the compression code so these are all directions in which you get this and um, it's guaranteed that you get this, these, these limits um, so essentially um, what you want want now uh, is the following um, You want to somehow make sure that 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 you get in all directions, um, uh, in all the generic directions, you get you get to see a conjugate of of H empty, um, because then then you start to 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 partition your A into copies of uh, of the compression cone, um, and this happens for generic adapted points. So there is a, a parametrization of adapted points by a, a, by a vector space uh, left out some some points. Uh, so for generic, so there's a notion of generic here. Um, for generic adapted point set, the following hold, um, namely that if I take a limit in a generic direction, then the limit is going to be a conjugate of H empty. Um, so this basically says that 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 up to uh, uh, well the walls of compression cone. So somehow this the, the compression cone is partitioning the um, partitioning the A. Um, so this is here for some W in the normalizer. Um, the other thing is that happens for generic points, uh, for generic adapted points, is that you get this condition. Um, on, uh, on on this on these phi sets that we uh, that I formulated before. So you want that uh, uh, the phi of W inverse z is equal to phi z for all W in phi z. Um, this makes it into a group. So this you can also arrange for generic adapted points. This is uh, this is going to happen. Um, yeah. So so if you have these two things, then let me try to go back to the theorem. Then you get uh, quite a bit of the theorem. Um, so you get Vz as a subgroup. Uh, you can take this quotient, you get some group. Um, and actually, this, this quotient um, is, is starting to look like, uh, like something that has a, a funda fundamental domain, the, the, uh, the compression code. Um, and that would actually identify it as a little like it. OK, so let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Qu questions, please. So I'm I'm a bit confused. So in, in the theorem you stated, you said so uh, Bernard uh, asked if if uh, is, so the adaptant points are all, always in the open orbit, right? Yes. Somehow we said that the open orbit, the points in the open orbit, do not are, are not special in the sense of your theorem, right? Now, so you can't just take an, an element in the open orbit. That that is not good enough. Right? So you have to. So they have to be in the open orbit, but you have to take them very specifically. Okay, so it's not any element in the or right. generic element. It's a specific, but it's in it's the open. It's very orbit. specific. Yeah, you cannot. Right. So as I said, so if you would take a generic choice, I mean, so generic generic choice of set will always be in an open orbit, right? So uh, then you yeah. find a group, but it's not going to be the little bar group. It's going to be yeah. a bigger one. So the fundamental domain for that one is going to be smaller. It's, it's rather close to the, 
of okay. the negative algebra. So, the, so, so it's a generic adapted point. This is this is the point that that satisfies. It's a generic the adapted point, exactly. Generic yeah. with respect to some sense of some. Yeah. Some yeah. So as I said, there is a parametrization of these things by a vector space. Um, so it's generic in that sense. Excellent. Maybe you explain this uh, for G mod n, I mean, uh, to, to Itai. I mean, because you already had this example. Right. Uh, uh, maybe it's easier if I just write it down because uh, rather than to find it in this, in the other pages. So as I said, if you look at the compression cone for for these points, so then uh, through the through the origin, mm -hmm. um, you always get a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you can also do this for m a translates. You still get a, but as soon as you as you do also something with n, and you do not get a. So this is for all mm -hmm. n in n without. Um, uh, without the identity. Mm -hmm. um, and this you, you will also find back in the adapted points. So if you look at what are the adapted points for, for, um, uh, for G mod n bar, yeah. um, then, then, then this is going to be one MA orbit. Um, and in this case, you could actually just take any, any of that. So this will always do the trick. Uh, so this will always give you the little wow group. The little wow group in this case is trivial. And, and what is the generic part of the MA orbit? Yeah, the generic example will work. So this, in this case, you don't need to put on any more restrictions. So actually, the generic, ah, okay. genericity yeah, is, is coming from the N. It's uh, the N that causes the problems, not the MA. Thanks. And for symmetric spaces, it's actually the same. So, so adapted points, um, so set symmetric. Uh, the adapted points um, form one MA orbit in each open orbit. So it's it's a uh, so this is MA through through uh, uh, to to a given one. So uh, this is a given uh, given adapted points, uh, adapted point. And this you can do in each open orbit, but that's the need. So you cannot you cannot translate it by n. That will immediately destroy this uh, this this uh, regularity condition. Uh, but in general, there may be more. Uh, so in, in uh, for other uh, real spherical spaces, you may actually be able to uh, uh, to to change it also to translate it in the n direction. Uh, I joined a few minutes late. Uh, what is the motivation for studying this problem? Well, the, the little bow group is, um, is an important thing also in, in the harmonic analysis of, uh, of real spherical space. So, so it is to be expected that the Fourier transform will, so the image of the Fourier transform will be invariant um, under uh, under an action of the little wow group. So this is the main motivation for us to look at this. Um, and image of what I didn't hear. So, so, it's, so the, the, the image of the V8 transform on, on a real spherical space is expected okay. to be invariant under some action of the of the little wow group. Okay. Um, this and, while group that you define. This is the wow group that I defined exactly, okay. and and somehow this wow group is around, um, so mm -hmm. it, it has been defined. And I but I and I, I mean, so we 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 didn't quite understand it. So what it, what is it really? I mean, so so it's a group, so it should it should somehow describe symmetries, symmetries of what? Mm -hmm. okay. Huh? okay. And for us, right. somehow these limits are, are very natural objects. So and, and we see it here as as a, as a symmetries of the limits of. of the, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For the questions, please. So I guess there were enough questions. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Yao. Thank you. All right. So we, we have a seminar next week with uh, the talk of Bing Su. 
what, on a packets for quasi split GSP to N and GSO to N over a periodic field. See you in two weeks. Uh, in a week, sorry. Yeah, thank you, you very much. It was great. No, thank you too. Indeed. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Oh, thank you.